Yes, we're here, and it's Jack Curry here, and I get the opportunity to talk to today a very special guest and one of my favorite players to ever cover because I loved his tenacity and I loved his honesty, and that's Jorge Posada. And Jorge, first of all, thanks for joining us. And the first question I have to ask you is, how is everything going with uh, you and your family, Laura, little Jorge, Paulina? How's everyone doing? Yeah, everybody's at home. Uh, we've been in here since uh, middle of uh, March now. Uh, and we've been uh, trying to stay busy, uh, doing some little things. The kids are going to school during the morning hours, uh, absolutely, you know, with uh, in the computer at home. Um, and we've been, uh, me and Laura, trying to different, do different things to try to stay busy. Uh, she's cooking a little bit more, uh, thank God, she's a good cook. And uh, we're working out in the, in the mornings and, you know, try to stay uh, a little bit busy inside the house. Yeah, it's important to have a routine, so I'm glad that you guys have latched on to one. I know that you're not a player anymore and you're retired, but you, have you thought at all what you would be doing right now if you were still playing? Just how you would try and deal with the uncertainty? Because these current Major League players, Jorge, they don't know when their, their next game or their next meaningful meeting with their teammates will be yeah i would uh you know we'll do a lot of a lot of cardio obviously uh you know try to find you know have a gym here at the house but not everybody has a gym at the house try to look for you know certain classes maybe live that are a little bit more uh you know cardio oriented and you know can take away your mind a little bit of, of the everyday uh, news that are not so they are not coming so 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 good uh, and try to try to keep it you know hitting is gonna be hard throwing is gonna be hard but you know try to keep your legs and your body ready to you know to when they you know they they say go uh, you are not you know falling behind. I'm glad you referenced the everyday news because it is hard to escape and our thoughts and prayers are with everyone who is going through this right now. And we're asking baseball questions because you work in baseball and I work in baseball, but obviously the importance is on helping and hoping that everyone gets through this. And I, I did want to ask you more than a year ago, you jumped back in the pool, so to speak, special advisor to baseball operations with the Marlins, obviously with Derek Jeter. Why was the timing right for you to jump back into baseball then? Well, there was a few things, you know, obviously Miami is home for me now. Uh, you know, Derek being uh, the CEO of, of the Marlins, uh, I thought the, the time was perfect. Uh, you know, the team is looking very promising. A lot of great, uh, you know, talent uh, coming up, uh, great pitching coming up. And wanted to be a part of, of uh, you know, of the organization, of the growing and uh, – Gary Dembo and, and Derek uh, gave me a call and, you know, what do you think about coming back and helping out, you know, a lot of the catchers uh, and what we need to go from here. That was last year, uh, last year, obviously. Uh, this year uh, I came to spring training with, with the focus of, of trying to help out a little bit more on the catching side and Jorge Alfaro and, you know, all the catchers that they had there, you know, Cervelli being in town now. Uh, it's just uh, – a great experience of being being able to you know to give back a little bit and and try to help out Derek and, and the organization of, of making this organization the you know the the way they want to Derek wants to be you know hands on and be a championship team uh, as soon as as soon as we can. You mentioned that connection with Jeter. Obviously, that's that's a deep friendship that that goes back many years. This summer, he will obviously be rewarded at some point heading into the Hall of Fame, you had a chance to watch him up close going back to the minor league days, Jorge. There's talent, but there's other parts of a game that make a player stand out. What made Derek Jeter stand out in your eyes? Winning. You know, from day one, you know, Derek cared about winning. One, number one, uh, his priority was to make this team uh, or his teams uh, win. And – you know, when we sit down and we kind of discuss the game after the game or before the game, what helped us win that day, what helped us lose that game, those were the conversations we had, 
probably post and, and, and a lot more during dinners after the games. Uh, what made us lose? Where do we lose the game? How come we didn't do this? Uh, and, you know, when you analyze the game like that as a player, uh, it, it just uh, helps out the team a lot more uh, because if everybody's looking at, at what to do to win ball games, uh, and that's the way we were. Uh, but Derek was just very special of, you know, not making excuses, being there every day. Um, you know, even when he was in pain, he wasn't pain a lot. He just didn't show it. He wanted to be in the lineup. And it just showed, showed me a lot. Uh, just wanted to be out there for, for his teammates and for his, uh, you know, for the, for the organization. Jorge, when the Hall of Fame voting comes around, it can be very cruel because players who have had superb careers don't sometimes get the percentage they thought they might get. I want to reel off some of your numbers. Lifetime, 273 batting average, 374 on base percentage, 474 slugging. You had 275 homers, 1,065 runs batted in. Of the triple crown numbers, the average, the home run, and the RBI, the only catchers in the Hall of Fame who can exceed all of those, Yogi Berra, Mike Piazza, Pudge Rodriguez. Yet, you were a one and done on the ballot, 5%, I, under 5%. I know you can't get inside the, the head of every voter, but did that surprise you? Did you think that you got a fair look on the Hall of Fame ballot? Jack, it's tough. It's really tough to, you know, when, when you're a player, you, you really don't think about being a Hall of Famer. You know, you, you think about, you know, what can I do to be a good baseball player, to be a, a winner, to be a guy, you know, be back. Honestly, I took a lot of pride uh, of doing things behind the plate and being there for my pitchers. Uh, and you don't think about what's going to happen after. You know, you just play the game. You do everything you can to, you know, to put up good numbers. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I can sit here and say, they had a, a, hell, a hell of a career, uh, and it's up, it's up to the media to look at my numbers and, and, and see and to try to compare them to other players, and it was tough. It was really tough not to, you know, to go above 5%, and, but you move on, and, you know, you hope that one day they can look at my numbers again and see what happens, but uh, I can't control that, and that's the way I was always taught. You can't control things, and, and you just got to move on. Well, interestingly enough, I, I was reading a story not too long ago, a couple, of year, a couple of years old, where you referenced Ted Simmons, and you kind of yeah. talked about how you had a similar career to Ted Simmons, and we know what happened this year with Ted Simmons. His career yeah. got another look, and eventually with, with one of the committees that can vote post-career, Ted Simmons will, will be joining uh, Derek and being enshrined this year. Yeah, I uh, – very comparable to, to Ted Simmons. I think my numbers are very, very similar to him. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, uh, hopefully the, the committee can look at my case and, you know, and, and we'll see. I, I just can't control it. If it happens, I'm, very, very, I'm going to be very, very honored. Uh, but if it doesn't, I had a hell of a career. Jorge, you played eight games in 1996, and then obviously you were much more of an instrumental part in 98, 99, 2000, 2009. How proud are you to be part of that Yankee history, that Yankee legacy of winning? We were taught well, Jack. I think, uh, you know, when you, when you come up to the system, uh, you know, the job they did for us as a minor leaguer, they really brainwashed us. Uh, winning was number one. Uh, and the discipline that it took to be a winner. Uh, you know, they taught us, you know, obviously not to shave, to, you know, the hair and everything. You know, it, it, it becomes part of your discipline. And, you know, the way you, you put on your uniform, the way you're supposed to carry yourself as a Yankee uh, is very important. Uh, I think uh, when, you, when I look back, when I, when I was retired, and other things that I look back and I'm – I was upset, you know, because, you know, I, I wanted to wear my, my pants long, you know, on top of my shoes like everybody else, and you couldn't do it. You know, you had to wear, you know, your pants and, and show, you know, a certain amount of inches of blue and a certain amount of inches of white. Uh, and, but it, it just makes you 
a player. It makes you understand what NY means, what the Yankees means. Uh, you know, baseball for us in New York was winning first. Uh, Mr. Stambrenner cared about winning more than anything. And he, you know, uh, took it all the way down to, to everybody. Uh, you know, winning was important. And he took care of us. He really did. He took care of us. He still took take care of those players, uh, you know, to make them uh, feel like they are part of this organization. And this, the way the organization goes about the business is about winning is number one. That's number one priority. Uh, and winning the minor leagues counts. And, and I think uh, it's important that everybody understand that the Yankee way was – you know, there was only one way and you needed to, you know, show up uh, every day to go play. One of the baseball cliches that we all latch on to is you need to be strong up the middle. And when you reflect on those Yankee years, it's you behind the plate. It's Jeter at shortstop. You head out to center field, it's Bernie Williams. And then right there on the mound, Pettit and Rivera. And I'm not excluding any of the other players who were on the teams at that time contributed, but those were the homegrown Yankees. As you were coming up, and I know Bernie was a step ahead of you guys, are you sensing or even dreaming that, that you're building something that could become what it eventually became? Uh, you know, I'm glad you touched on Bernie. You know, Bernie was that key guy that he was very successful. Uh, and if he didn't pan out, I don't think the Jeters and the Posadas and the Pettit or the Mariana Riveras would have been there. We would have been gone. When, in, when, when Bernie starts playing good and he's coming from the minor leagues and he's, you know, showing what he can do, you know, obviously he opened the door for all of us. Uh, and, you know, Bernie was the key. You know, he really was. Uh, you know, and then you brought in Andy and, and, and Mo there and then, you know, Derek and then me at, at the end. Uh, but I think uh, we, we all graduated, you know, to that position. You know, Bernie did it first. Derek did it, you know, uh, with a tough spring training. Mariano started, and then he was a reliever. And Andy just, you know, got better and better and better every time he got there. He started, you know, working out and getting better, his body. Uh, so we graduated to our position. Nowadays, you have guys that are handed, you know, the position. Here, here you go. This is your position. And I don't feel like – that's the way we should be. You gotta, you gotta earn that, that spot. I think it's a lot, a lot more fun when you are, uh, you know, when you graduate and you win that spot for, for the team. When Mariano was enshrined into Cooperstown last summer, he wanted to make sure that his buddies were there. So you were there. Derek was there. Andy Pettit was there. Bernie performed, so he was there. Tina Martinez was there. You guys had some time to spend some alone time where there's no television cameras, there's nobody taking notes. If we could have been a fly on the wall in, in that moment, Jorge, what is it like? Are, are you guys back in the clubhouse? Are you guys teasing each other just as you had 20 years earlier? 100%. 100%. We are uh, very tough on each other. Uh, we give a hard time to each other. Obviously, Mariano, we gave him a hard time because his speech took too long. He said it was going to be short. And it was a thousand degrees in, in Cooperstown last year. We were sweating. We had suits on. And, uh, but other than that, we had a great time. We wanted to be there for him. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's important that, that we were there for him. Uh, and I think we'll do the same thing with Derek. There are men and women who are 20, in their 20s, 30s, 40s right now who watched you play. Let, let, let's, let's go 50 years in the future. And one of their grandchildren says to them, they see a Jorge Posada card. They look at the numbers and they say, hey, grandma, hey, grandpa, what was this player like? What was Jorge Posada like? What would you like that grandparent to tell that grandchild? Uh, he played the game right. Uh, he cared about his teammates. He cared about, about winning. Uh, and it's all about heart. It was all about heart. I mean, to tell the truth, I, you know, I wasn't the best at anything, but uh, I had more heart than anybody. You know what I thought about as I had the opportunity to talk to you? And I, I think I've asked you this question, but way back 
in the past. Do you ever think at night about how meaningful slash monumental it was that you switched from infielder to catcher and just how that triggered all of the changes that occurred in your career? Yeah, I, th I don't think I would have been a big leaguer. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, a, a little bit here and there if I would have played, you know, maybe somewhat of a good of a first baseman or, or third baseman. As a middle infielder, I don't, I don't think I would have been a big leaguer. Uh, but when I became a catcher, you know, everything opened up for me. Uh, there's no catchers in the big leagues. You know, there's only a few. There's only three or four. Um, and to be able to do it for that long uh, as a position, a position that I didn't play from the get-go is crazy. It really is. You know, in New York, to be playing, you know, to be playing in that position, it just, it takes a lot. And I'm super proud. From having interviewed your dad and knowing the influence that he had on your career, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I think you would probably also say you wouldn't have made it to the major leagues with, without his influence. What was your dad's influence in, in teaching you resilience and teaching you hard work and teaching you persistence to get to the point that you did get to? Yeah, I saw it in him. He's a, he was a hard worker, you know, and he, you know, brought – he would come home late and, you know, doing four or five uh, jobs to try to get us, you know, food in the table. Not that we were hurting for food, but he was out there hustling. And I saw it and, and I think it, it helped me a lot because uh, I became, you know, the hard worker that I was. I'm still working hard. I don't know why. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's in me. And, you know, I, I always wanted to prove myself and get better every year uh so i work harder uh at my craft every year and wanted to improve uh, every year in my numbers i think uh my dad was a big big example we can joke about this now because your careers are over and they have been successful some of your teammates used to talk about how you and el duque would have some very animated discussions when he was on the mound and you were behind the plate what was that like? Because you were both so animated and you both wanted to do things a certain way. It kind of hurt my relationship with him, you know, uh, because I wanted to bring the best out of El Duque. And a calm El Duque was not a good El Duque. So I would make sure that he was pissed off before he pitched. So I would throw the ball really hard at him. I would throw it at his knees. I would throw it even lower at his ankle. He would look at me. And I can tell, you know, if I had him, just the way, because of his expression of his face. If he was uh, very calm and everything was okay, he started talking to everybody, it was, it's going to be a long day. So I needed to get him, you know, focused at me and maybe pissed off at me and, and get him through the game. Uh, and that's the way certain players, that worked. I couldn't do that to Andy. I could have done it to David Wells. Uh, Roger Clemens, I could have done that, you know, get him, you know, fiery. But some guys, you know, you couldn't do that too. So you have to find, you know, certain uh, ways to get the pitcher or the pitcher that's going to be in the mound that day to get him through uh, or get him in, into the game. So that's an example of you kind of playing the mental side of things. David Cohn used to say sometimes he always wanted his catcher to be a co-pilot. But sometimes you needed to be a cheerleader. Sometimes you needed to scold him. Sometimes you needed to be a psychiatrist. And in that moment or moments with El Duque, I guess that's what you were doing, trying to get inside his head because you knew how to, what made him tick. No question. No question. And uh, El Duque was uh, very mental. Very, uh, he would think a lot about things. Uh, obviously, he didn't know the, you know, when he first came, he didn't know the, the league. So I, I was there to try to, you know, get him through the game and stuff like that. But you know, perfect example, Ryan Klesko hits a home run of a curveball, breaking ball. I think it was, I don't remember the count, but obviously hits a home run on a, on a breaking ball. So on the next at bat, I'm calling fastballs and change up, and, and he's shaking me off. And I'm like, uh, what is he doing? So he wants a curveball. I know he wants a curveball, but I'm not calling it. So here we go. He's shaking me, shaking me, shaking me, and he wants a breaking ball. So I call breaking ball, and he hits another home run off a, of, of a breaking ball. Third at bat, and Duke obviously is throwing very good. I think the only uh, gave, uh, runs he gave up was those two home runs. So the third at bat with Klesko, he comes up, 
And I go, I want to throw something inside and, you know, some change-ups and stuff. And he's like, no, breaking ball. And I'm like, uh, no, 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 Duke, no, no. Yeah, he see you two, you know, two, two home runs and two curveballs. He goes, breaking ball. I throw him a breaking ball. He pops it up to short, and he starts screaming at him in Spanish. So you're not that good in Spanish. You're just screaming at him. He's looking at him all crazy. Uh, so that's, that's the El Duque, and you love that from him. That, that is a great anecdote, a great story. And as I wind things up with you here, I want to do some word association. Well, it's, it's name association. I'm going to say a name, and if you had the first thing that comes to mind, an anecdote, story, and I'm gonna, I have to start with you, your buddy, your number one guy. You already kind of talked about him, but if I say Derek Cheater, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Leader, a winner. Uh, you know, a guy that you want on your side. How about Andy Pettit? Andy Pettit was soft, soft-spoken. I mean, not soft, soft-spoken, uh, quiet. But when he was on the mound, he was focused. He was prepared. And, you know, you won him in a big game. Number 42, Mariano Rivera. The greatest ever. There's nobody like him. Uh, he has so much confidence that, you know, there's nobody that can, that can beat him when he was in the mound. Nobody. This almost seems unfair to ask a catcher this question. Was he easy to catch? He was the best. He made my job so easy. Uh, just number one. You know, I, you know, he started throwing the sinker uh, later on in his career. So we had a one or two. Uh, and then we changed the sign. You know, it was so easy because he was, you know, uh, this side or that, or, or that other side. So I knew he was going to throw, you know, either a cutter on this side or a, or a two-seamer on that side. Uh, he threw cutters on this side. But we had different signs to – you know, so we don't have to, you know, give the only number one with the guy at second base. How about Don Mattingly? Uh, probably my, my best hitting coach that I had. Uh, he really, I mean, he was my idol. That's the guy that I look up to when I was growing up. And when I had him there, and he was there every day, you know, look for me, come here, let's go to the cage. You know, I, 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 at times I felt, you know, in spring training, like, I'm, I mean, this is not matter. I'm making him work too much. And he's, and he's like, no, 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 no. I'm here for you. I want you to get this. I want you to – he wanted me to get on top of the baseball. And, I mean, he helped me so much. I interviewed Jim Abbott about a week ago, and he said when he first got to the Yankees, his first spring training, pitcher's fielding practice was on a backfield in Fort Lauderdale. The position players weren't even supposed to be there yet. First day he showed up for PFPs. Mattingly was the guy taking throws at first base and imploring the pitchers to get to the ball. And Jorge, you and I have, you've seen more than me, but I've seen thousands of PFPs. A lot of times the guy at first base is just a coach or mm -hmm. it's just an extra player. And yeah. there was Mattingly telling Abbott, hey, we're here to try and win. Let's, yeah. let's do this drill the right way. Yeah, I, I got a better, better uh, anecdote. anecdote. Uh, his locker was next to, my locker was next to him in 1994 in Fort Lauderdale. And I'll get there early, uh, but I could never beat him to the stadium. So one day, I'm like, okay, I'm going to wake up. I was like 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. I wake up. I go. I don't eat. I just go straight to – and I hear – I'm like, I think I beat him. And I see his jeans already hung. And I'm like, where is he? So I'm looking for him, you know, because, I mean, he was my favorite. Uh, so I will go out, and he's catching pop-ups. Off the machine at five o'clock in the morning in shorts. Like he wanted balls over his head. And I'm like, this guy is ridiculous. I mean, that, tell, that told me so much uh, about him. 5 a.m.? Pop ups. 5 a.m. Butterfields swing uh, off the machine. It's crazy. Wow. Yep. That, that seems like a fitting way to end this because I don't think you're going to come up with a better story <laughs> than that. And Jorge, we, we really appreciate you giving us this time, and uh, I hope you and your family continue to stay safe. We're, I think we're all going to get through this if we keep making smart decisions. But, again, as I said at the top of this, it was always a pleasure to cover you, and it brought back memories for me to get the uh, opportunity to interview you one more time like this. No problem. Thank you, Jack. And uh, I really 
I really am uh, very humble uh, on the things that we were able to, to do as, uh, as a team. And it's not easy. We made it look easy. Uh, but, it, you know, you can see now, you know, how tough it was to, you know, to do that, to do it back to back and to back. And, and you know, the, the off seasons were really short, but we were looking forward to, you know, to, for the run. And it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> you.